Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking part in this colloquium. The object of our meeting today is to discuss Frank Biebert's recent book called Comity, Multilateralism in the New Cold War. And it really is um, a very concise, very precise, and very illuminating book. So it's a, it's a pleasure, Frank, to be able to discuss this book. Now we have, we have two commentators today. First of all, Professor Paul Craig, who is Professor of English Law Emeritus in the University of Oxford, a fellow of St. John's College, Oxford, and a fellow of the British Academy. Paul is well known in his field of administrative law and of European Union law, as well as various other things, but they are the two main ones. Richard is Professor of International Relations at Oxford. Richard is a fellow of Lineker College, and his specialty is in international organizations and conflict management, post-conflict. The author today, who is going to explain and set out the main arguments of this book, is Frank Biebert. Frank is a research associate at the Carr Institute of the London School of Economics. He is a fellow of the Oxford Global Society, a relatively recent think tank. He's formerly a senior advisor for many years at the World Bank. On leaving the World Bank, he founded the European Policy Forum, a very successful and well-known think tank. Frank's field of activity mainly is in constitutional theory and regulatory government. So we have a very impressive lineup, uh, our author and our two commentators. May I just say that the uh, procedure will be as follows. Frank will give an introduction to his book, which will last for 15 to 20 minutes. Professor Craig will then comment, and his comments will last 10 to 15 minutes. And then Professor Kaplan will give his comments uh, about the same time. After that, we will open the discussion to um, panelists as well as the audience that has registered. So prepare your questions. We will try to deal with as many as we can, can't guarantee all. We will aim to finish at about five or 10, 15 minutes after five, but it won't drag on beyond that. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce Frank and invite him to present his argument. Frank. Thank you very much, Dennis. Can everybody hear me? Um, I would like to go straight into my presentation um, with the help of some slides. Um, can everybody see those? And uh, I'll start just by saying something about the title. Um, comity refers to a situation where you have overlapping jurisdictions in the same space, and it refers to the hope that one can manage those relationships without conflict or find a way between jurisdictional conflict. The phrase, the new Cold War, um, refers to the, uh, it's not a difference uh, of global worldviews as between communism and capitalism, but it refers to fundamental differences in the domestic character of governments. John Rawls had made a distinction between well-ordered societies and outlaw societies, I don't like the phrase outlaw societies because it suggests actors at the periphery. And of course, in today's world, we have authoritarian regimes such as China and Russia very much at the center. When communism collapsed, I think many of us, including myself, hoped that we would see a trend towards a new world order and a convergence of international norms. Um, but it hasn't happened. And to some extent, globalization is, uh, is in retreat. And the book starts by discussing why this is the case. Uh, one explanation is just populism around the world. The other is it's economic nationalism. Uh, 
But the book discusses a different reason for this, and it is the impact of the knowledge economy. Economies around the world are driven by data, by information, by content. And in the knowledge economy, countries choose to apply different values, different principles. For democracies, values such as privacy, probity, and personhood are, are essential. For uh, authoritarian countries, the only thing that matters is control. Sometimes the word stability is used, but that's a euphemism for party control. And this affects most areas of, pub of public policy. Uh, privacy in the private sphere is critical, obviously, in any transactions involving authentication, prediction, validation, the world of the internet and financial transactions. It's clearly critical where issues of personhood are involved, such as artificial intelligence, but it affects many other areas of public policy. Um, we can think of uh, environment, for example, where it's absolutely essential that reporting is accurate. And we've had recent allegations that China has, uh, that, sorry, that Russia has been vastly underreporting its methane gas emissions. It, it, help, it also affects, for example, health where we've had this very sad case where China has not uh, let back the World Health Organization to investigate the start of the COVID uh, pandemic. So it affects uh, these days with the knowledge economy, um, it affects most areas of public policy. So if you look at what stands as a block in the way of international rulemaking, a very, uh, uh, one very important reason, and it goes right back to the start of the post-war world, is about differences over rules of governance, over decision rules. You then may get different interpretations of aims, but what the book fingers is, is the different choice of values to be applied, and it is this where the block in today's uh, rulemaking seems to occur. And this reflects uh, the difference between authoritarian and, and uh, democratic countries. And this uh, applies to, um, uh, has an impact in two rather important areas. One, it, the first thing is it undermines the traditional principle in the post-World War of functionalism, the view that the values behind the domestic organization of authority was separable from tasks at the international level. These levels are no longer separable. The other uh, presumption, which uh, is now no longer uh, valid, is about extraterritoriality, presumption that uh, uh, countries will not make laws which affect others. In fact, countries are now concerned about other jurisdictions reaching in in the internet world, and they have a motivation to reach out. So the presumption against extraterritoriality uh, has uh, basically gone. So we now have blockage in international rulemaking, and the book identifies two potential ways out of this block. One is to segment the agenda. That means you avoid any issues of principle or differences of values by getting down into detail and uh, splitting the agenda up into small pieces. I use the phrase disjointed incrementalism, which is a phrase I've taken from literature on the policy process, comes from Ed Lindblom. But the book, but the book essentially looks at the other alternative, which is to go, go ahead with international rulemaking by smaller groups of like-minded democratic countries. And such small uh, democratic groups can substitute for and provide a step towards the fully international to later point. And we've had a recent example with the minimum corporation tax, which started life uh, as discussion under discussion in the uh, OECD, was then accepted and endorsed by the G7, then by the G20, and has now been accepted by 130, 140 countries around the world. That is essentially the model uh, discussed um, uh, in, in the book. And in, as an example of like-minded groups around the world, the, the main example is OECD, um, but you have other ones, so the Five Eyes air, uh, uh, group in the security area, the Quad group more recent, has recently announced a vaccine partnership, and of course the G7 and the G10. 
There are other groups which can be seen as like-minded uh, clustered around the Bank for International Settlements and organizations such as IOSCO, but they essentially operate by splitting up the agenda into technical areas. So they're more consistent with the second option, which is of, a, of pursuing a segmented agenda. So the book doesn't uh, deal with them any further. Now, there are certain uh, weaknesses um, of uh, going ahead with um, uh, like-minded groups. And these uh, weaknesses go back to traditional arguments about comedy. And uh, one uh, ob objection is that it leads to rulemaking by the powerful. And the book discusses that in terms not of powerful states, but in terms of the power of technocrats which is a concern in international rulemaking, particularly concerns its um, uh, legitimacy. Um, another very traditional uh, reservation about uh, overlapping jurisdictions is that conflict cannot be avoided. It's inevitable. And I will say something about that. And then there's a question as to, is it legitimate for like-minded uh, countries to go at group together and go ahead on international rulemaking and hope that others will come along uh, and follow them? So if I turn, if I put aside capture and go straight to the issue of conflict, the, the situation we have is we do not have any unified hierarchy of legal systems or jurisdictions, for example, under the, e, the United Nations nor do we have full coordination between member states. So we're looking at how do you contain friction in what has been called a gray zone between a fully integrated system and uh, conflict. And here the key uh, instruments are what are known as permissive norms. And these can be positive, for example, of one jurisdiction can see, investigate whether another jurisdiction applies the same kind of standards and values. And if it does, then well and good, there's no friction. They can also uh, look and see that, well, values are not the same, but nevertheless, maybe they're going to converge. So they decide to remain silent. That's permissive in a passive sense. Those are two very well-known techniques and they're important. But at the end of the day, you may get a jurisdiction that wants to claim superiority. And uh, the EU is in that situation at the moment in relation to its environmental um, program where it's proposing a carbon border adjustment measure, which is essentially to try and level up the playing field so that everybody else um, is doing things the same way as it. And that is essentially a claim about it's got a superior approach to environmental issues. Now, when it comes to legitimacy, what we have to accept is that there's no generally acceptable theoretical basis for what makes international rulemaking legitimate. And justifications of authority um, are offered at three levels, at the global level, where uh, global values are appealed to, at a uh, level of states, if the idea being that if all states agree on a rule, then that rule is legitimate, or justification can be offered at the individual um, uh, level. And when like-minded groups of democratic countries get together, they're essentially appealing to um, an individualist um, approach to uh, legitimation. And it's about uh, claiming that the content of what they do is likely to be uh, consistent with the presuppositions of democracies and the procedures they followed in making those laws are likely to be consistent with the lawmaking procedures expected in democracies. So you see properties of laws such as laws apply equally, which democracies would expect and they make their rules um, according to procedures which seem valid in democracies. So they have a claim um, uh, for legitimacy along those sorts of lines. So if I summarize the argument of the book, um, it is that when communism collapsed, we all hoped for a new world order with convergence around global norms, and it hasn't happened. And so the book explores a world where there is a fundamental divide between the values of democratic societies and the values held by authoritarian regimes and their ruling cliques and their parties. <laughs>
The book argues that in this situation, the responsibility for protecting and projecting international rules of behavior rests with groups of like-minded democratic countries joining together and taking the lead in making the rules. But it ends, of course, on a note of caution. They've got to refresh their alliances. Many of the alliances are jaded, and they also have to refresh their own democratic structures. We have to be concerned about democratic backsliding within these societies. So that, I think, is the main theme of the book, and I hope that gives you uh, something on which to uh, comment. Thank you very much, Frank. That was a, a very nice, concise introduction. I think there are quite a few points there that our commentators and our audience might want to take up, but let's move directly to Professor Paul Craig. Paul, over to you. <clears throat> um, Dennis, thanks very much indeed, and Frank, thank you. Um, so let me say that very much that I enjoyed the book. Um, uh, as Dennis said in his introduction, there's a, it's a very precise and concise book. There's a huge amount packed in there and it's thought provoking and insightful in equal measure. And in, in really is, and you have to sort of, you know, pause and think about it because there is a lot in the 128 pages or whatever that constitutes the book. So thank you, Frank, for the book and for sharing it with us. So because the book has a huge amount in it, notwithstanding its relative brevity judged by page length, I'm not going to try and touch base with all the issues that Frank just adumbrated in his own talk. Um, I'm going to hit four issues within the time that I've got available. And um, the second, third, and fourth are linked in a way that will become apparent in a moment. And the second, third, and fourth are linked by just some observations about the nature of the challenges faced both by democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes when engaged in rulemaking at the international level. And I'll be talking about two, three, and four in due course. What I'd like to do though, and is to have as my first point, Something which, I mean, it, and it should just be regarded, Frank, as, as a genuine question. It's a, it's a bit of a pushback, but um, at least I'll put it as question number, point number one, so you have a few minutes to think about it, as it were. Um, um, so, and it is distinct from two, three, and four, so I was going to have it either as four or one, but I thought it's better as one. So the first point then really has two sub points. One is about the very nature of what the work comedy is doing as a concept in the book. And the other related point, but as a second order point is the work these, the is just to get you to talk a little bit more about why the emphasis on privacy and the private sphere as the lens through which to view the tension between democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes. So let me just then, given the limits of my own time, say the following about the first of these two points of 1A, as it were. What strike me, struck me in the way that you presented it, and it struck me equally in the book, is that in effect, there's two rival, not rival, but two different senses of comedy um, in this book. One is a kind of narrow, rather specific sense, and the other is very much broader. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but it seems to me at least we should be perhaps aware that there are two different senses of comedy knocking around. The one that you chose to highlight in your own presentation just now is a conception of comedy which I regard as the narrower one 
and the more specific one, I think you actually framed it. I don't put, take words out of your mouth or put words into your mouth, but you very much framed it in terms of a legal, a more legalistic concept of, of comity. This was a jurisdiction idea. Comity as a distinct legal concept has purchase value in terms of, well, we're going to give leeway to this other country because we think that this lies better within their jurisdiction. And it was actually a jurisdictional plea. It was part of a jurisdictional plea within the terrain of international law and private international law. There's also, I think, a much broader sense of comedy in the book. And I just you know, like to hear a bit more from Frank about what he thinks about this duality or whether he thinks there is a duality, but there is a broader sense because there's much in this book which is really interesting, but it ain't really anything to do with comedy in that narrow uh, jurisdictional legal sense. And I'm not saying that's per se wrong or anything. I'm just saying it's worthy of just remark. Because what, and one can think of arguments for and against the narrow and the broad view. The argument against, or, the, or at least a point that needs to be made about the broad view is that while it allows one to raise interesting issues, I guess that my, the nagging question in my mind is, well, where does it stop? I mean, on one view, the broad view of comedy is that it means nothing more than, well, this is a reason that states individually have a rational self-interest in acting collectively at the international level, and therefore they do so. Um, uh, and when they're like-minded, the collective interest has particular purchase. And I can, I, I mean, really, it was thought provoking. I can see the sort of sense of that. I just, I just, I'd like to hear from other people in the audience as well about whether they feel, how they feel that that is distinctive enough to have the label comedy put on it, as opposed to some other hat label um, uh, to describe what's going on. And uh, okay, so I don't want to take too much time on this. The second part, and I genuinely again like to hear from Frank about this, is that we have this tension set up between authoritarian regimes and more democratic regimes, and I don't have any problem with that. I was nonetheless a little surprised about the fact that the main fo focal point lens through which the tension was viewed was um, about privacy and, and, and the private sphere. Not that I don't think that's important. Of course it's important. But if the main folk, if the main tension is between you know, democratic and authoritarian regimes, there's just a shed load of other stuff about fundamental rights and all the stuff that's going on all the time, you know, whether it's in Belarus or whether it's in Kazakhstan or whatever, which is, you know, in, to coin a phrase, more in one's face, as it were, than the tensions that arise from privacy in the public sphere. Okay, so that's point one. Um, well, sorry to interrupt. Point. You're going to have to push along a little bit. Where you're getting a bit tight. On okay, time. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Point two, three, and four. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dennis, for pushing me along. Okay, point two, very briefly then. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's an interesting tension in um, the way in which democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes regard international rulemaking. And I don't think it's a paradox, but I think it's interesting, and I'm not saying it's inconsistent with anything you said, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. And of course, the tension or the uh, or paradox, if you want to call it, but that's tendentious, is that international rulemaking for democratic regimes is a whole lot more difficult than it is for authoritarian regimes. 
because the root cause of that problem is that for democratic regimes, everyone says, oh, well, when you make rules at the international level, domestic parliaments, the people don't have voice, it's made by the executive, it's administered by the executive, and the scant um, uh, popular voice or control. Um, by way of contrast, of course, for authoritarian regimes, that tension is not there because the people don't have a voice at the domestic level anyway, and therefore they don't expect a voice at the, author at the international level. Indeed, for authoritarian regimes, to some extent, the thing gets tilted the other way because authoritarian regimes may, in relative terms, be more circumscribed at the, at the international level by the very fact that they have to play the game with other parties than they do at the, the national level. Okay, um, third point, sorry, second point, um, no, uh, no, third point. Third point is that uh, again, it's um, just a thought about international rulemaking and democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes. And the point, putting it very uh, simply in the limited term available, is this. I mean, basically, one of the messages from the extensive literature and in international rulemaking is that <clears throat> even if you go down the route, and I can see you very much attraction to Frank's route of the like-minded states just getting on with it. Of course, what happens is that when you do that, the rules of the game are made by the dominant players and the dominant players are not equally spread. The dominant players for international rulemaking certainly in technocratic issues broadly defined, you know, the EU and the US and actually in relative terms, the EU punches above its weight, and in relative terms, the US, for a variety of reasons which have been pointed out in the literature, punches below its weight. So I just think it's an interesting factor to put into the mix of what you're talking about, which is that one advantage of the like states going off and doing their stuff is that the rules they make, at least some of them, and not ones about fundamental rights necessarily, but a lot of the technocratic stuff is going to govern transactions in authoritarian states because they're the rules of the game and the players have to accept them if they want to do business in those spheres. Fourth and final point um, is that <clears throat> is um, a second order issue, and you do discuss this, and I thought it was really interesting your discussion which is what I call second order rules about decision-making, soft consensus versus striving for harder forms of majoritarian decision-making, um, which you discuss with insight in the book. My only thought about this, and again, it's just a thought about it and it relates to some of the bigger themes you talk about, is that if you think about the EU as a test case, the shift to majoritarianism away from unanimity mm -hmm. <clears throat> is predicated in part, at least, on or raises interesting questions about the definition of like states. So the reason why you moved away from everyone, every state having a veto point, which is what you have under unanimity decision-making rules, is that the EU was grinding to halt, as we all know and as you know, and the majoritarian forms of decision-making were felt necessary to keep the ship of state moving. That has been reinforced by fractures within the EU, where although the states are broadly like, we all know that there's, you know, Hungary, Poland, uh, Romania problems about democratic backsliding, which means that if you start to unanimity or in areas where there is unanimity, it makes uh, any action extremely difficult. So there's a linkage between second order forms of decision making, I think, yeah. and what like states actually mean. Sorry, Dennis, I went That's on. All right, Paul. Thank you. Very, very perceptive comments, Frank. I hope you're taking notes there. You've got some <laughs> things to account for. Okay, we're <coughs> going to Richard. Is Richard with us? Sorry, 
it seems that he just can't join in. We right. have tried every method. It's just All right. Yeah. Well, we apologies to poor old Richard. Uh, we, we'll have to proceed without his comments, I'm afraid. Um, so thanks anyhow, Jenny, for trying so hard to bring him in. Uh, I, I will just follow up Paul's comments with, um, in the absence of Richard, uh, I uh, can't pretend to follow in his footsteps, but I'll make a couple of comments that occurred to me uh, as I was reading Frank's book and listening to his presentation. I think some of them might be quite compatible with things Paul was saying. So, Frank, I think I have um, three points to make here. The first is your model of comedy or of like-mindedness, if I can call it a model, I don't suppose everybody thinks it should be called a model, but let's call it a model. So, mm -hmm. so on this model, we have a, a, an irreconcilable division, it would appear, between two sets, of, between two blocks. You call them authoritarian on the one hand and democratic on the other hand. I always find it a bit difficult to talk about democracy because I never know what it means. But um, actually, Frank, you didn't actually you didn't say in your book what democracy means either. So it's a it's almost a bit it's a bit like the chancellor's foot, isn't it? How equity was pretty much the length. I think that really is a point. But that's not my main point. My main point here is that if we adopt this side by side approach, so you deal only with those who have common understandings, doesn't that divide the world even more? Doesn't that uh, fuel the Cold War rather than in any way solve it or soften it or ameliorate it? It seems to me that instead of aiming for some sort of universal concord, as difficult as it may be, your models divide the world even more sharply. You remind me of a way of Europe in the medieval period after the collapse of Rome. Europe formed a whole lot of tiny little princedoms and kingdoms and everyone retreated to their castle, pulled up the moat, pulled up the bridge and in a way cultivated not concord even amongst cultivated conflict. So the more we withdraw into our own corners and someone else withdraws into their own corners, in some way this aggravates the tensions at the international level, number one. Number two, follows from that, what happens to all those non-aligned nations? So if we have roughly 190 nations in the world, they are surely not all grouped into, into simply two departments. We have enormous, let's imagine we have, okay, we have the authoritarian states on the one hand, on your terminology, not mine, we have the democratic states on the other hand, but surely we have a lot of people floating around in the middle. <laughs> uh, uh, small states, big states, but not aligned particularly to either. Not only that, not particularly authoritarian or democratic. Where do they fit? My third point is my most important point, at least according to my opinion. You may not think so. Perhaps, Frank, if we put aside these geopolitical values, authoritarianism, democracy, these are, these are high level political values, constitutional political values. Supposing we change the logic completely, we look at fields of activity. Uh, I got this word field from old Bourdieu. I think it's a beautiful word though to express this. So fields of activity. Now recently we published on our website here a report on technology, for example, on the problem of companies from China or the United States or wherever overtaking the technical issues, the technical in European countries. What we argued there was that if you put aside the political values for a moment, if you start with what is the nature of the activity, what is its purpose? Well, the purpose here in technology is to build up the technical strength of each nation. If you then ask how that's going to be done, it's got nothing to do with 
high political values. It's got to do with how do you develop rules about the development of technology on some sort of equitable basis. There may be, of course, some background values, of course, but those background values don't divide between authoritarian and democratic states. Basic ideas of fairness between parties in a social relationship, for example. So that this, on this approach, you, you, you put aside the political values for the moment um, as simply logically distinct from the activities. Now I've used, uh, we use, Zhu Feng and I in our report, we use the case of technical digital advance, but you could apply this to all sorts of uh, trade, even something as, uh, as apparently non-political as sport. Everyone, every nation has an interest in trade, every nation has an interest in sport. I don't suppose the Serbians would admit to that just at the moment, but <laughs> interest in sport. Uh, you can think of endless cases um, where uh, there is no close relationship between high political constitutional values on the one hand, or ideologies, if you like, on the one hand, and the field of activity which has its own purposes and its own logic on the other hand. Now, uh, Richard's still not available. So Frank, we'll, perhaps we'll give you uh, a very brief window of reply. So five minutes, and then I'd like to open it up to the, to the audience. Thank you, Dennis. You. Uh, okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, can you hear me? Uh, uh, yep, yeah, very clear. Okay. Um, let me take your um, first point that I'm dividing the world up. Well, yes, I am, because I'm uh, really uh, flagging uh, a blindness that people were along a happy path, thinking we're all going to converge in the end, and we can do, we can cooperate in these technical areas, and everything is fine. And I'm flagging up that that is not fine, that there are these fundamental differences between authoritarian and what we should could call loosely democratic or countries, countries based on some kind of consent of the population. Um, and we should not be blind to these differences. I mean, the world has turned in the past, turned a blind eye on uh, regimes which espoused uh, appalling values under Nazi Germany or under Stalinist Russia. And we cannot repeat that same mistake. We have to recognize that there is these differences in values and that they have an impact on international rulemaking. And in particular, they have really brought it to a halt and we have to come to grips with that. And that gets me to um, uh, Paul's point about comity in, a narrow sense. Yes, we, we start with a broad sense. We'd like a world where everybody cooperates out of collective self-interest. Um, but that's not the, uh, the world we're in. And we have to think of the normative issues at stake and how we, how we deal with those. And that uh, involves looking at a smaller group of countries that are like-minded on norms and will go ahead um, or in pursuit or in defense of those, uh, those norms. Now, what happens to the non-aligned? Um, well, of course, this is where permissiveness norms in a silent sense uh, um, uh, make sense. Uh, if you uh, think that there are countries that may um, uh, eventually come around to, to your values, you might very well want to give them um, uh, a grace period and you don't uh, and you talk softly to them you don't uh, and you don't press your differences and um, this very much uh, might apply to to most of the world but where the where the values are being rejected then you do want to call them out you do want to call out mr putin's russia you do want to call out the chinese communist party and so that's uh, that's what the uh, the issue is um, and your point that we can still uh, pursue technical um, fields, well, this is trying to get back to functionalism, uh, that we can treat international cooperation as a technical issue, and I really don't think it works. Um, I don't think you can allow uh, 
um, a mobile phone operator into a country, if you think that the, any information it scoops up is available to a, a government that uh, may misuse that information. So that dividing the technical in the knowledge economy from data gathering, information processing, content is really uh, just not possible. It's not the way the, the world works is, uh, today. And we need to recognize that these uh, are now real, real barriers uh, in the world to, to transactions. And um, that is perhaps why uh, I also didn't uh, say much about um, uh, human rights, um, uh, uh, except in relation to legitimacy, because um, as a, an economist or as a political economist, I'm interested in economic trends and what binds countries together, which is um, uh, economic transactions. And my point is that these transactions are more and more driven by uh, data, trust in contracts, um, probity of data, um, knowing that when a company um, uh, uh, says it's owned by private uh, owners, it really is private owners and not the state lurking behind it, all those kinds of things. This is really um, what is driving the, um, the economies these days. And you have to be concerned, not just about privacy, but trust in data, probity of data, integrity of data, uh, as well as issues such as personhood. And these are just as important um, as, and they stand alongside, um, I would say, uh, with basic human rights. Um, and as an economist, I was particularly concerned uh, with these because they're very much what drives, drives the, uh, the global economy. Uh, uh, Paul raised the question about the EU and how much does this um, apply to the, in the EU? There's a, a limit to, um, uh, uh, well, let me put it this way, that like-mindedness sometimes breaks down and you need some kind of second order rules which enable um, you to overcome that in the mentioned Poland and Hungary. Um, I think that is true in, in the context of the EU, where the aim is to have a, some kind of political state of Europe at the end of the day. But I'm saying that for international cooperation, you don't have that overriding political aim. Uh, and if you can't um, uh, reach consensus, then you don't, you don't reach a consensus in that area and you accept that. And I make the case that um, although this may seem like a weakness, um, unanimity is also a defense against error. And one sees quite a lot of um, erroneous directives and regulations uh, in the EU without being precise about them. So there's, uh, there is a gain as, as well as a loss, but the loss clearly is that you, you're not able to go ahead with uh, rules in that area if you don't have a consensus. Um, so Frank, I'm going to, I'm going to call, call you to a halt there, if that's okay. okay yes. We're running into time, so we can okay. let in our... Um, now, Richard Clary, you've raised a question. Chufang, would you mind letting Richard in, Richard Clary in, if that's possible? Richard, you could you could express your question directly, your comments. They're a bit. Richard, you there? If if I must, although I think some of mine have already been covered by uh, your comments, Dennis, and by Paul's. Uh, I had had three questions. One was in in your slide, you simply said no next to the EU as a like-minded democratic group. I think we've touched upon some of the problems with that, but I'm sort of curious as to, with such an emphatic no on the slide. Um, <laughs> um, my, my other thought, which is similar to a question Dennis asked was, if, the, if rulemaking is to be done by limited like-minded democratic groups, and authoritarian governments are therefore excluded and will see themselves as excluded, are they not then more likely to not wish to voluntarily accept a set of norms that they feel are being imposed upon them because they were not consulted in the first place? And my third question was just basically at the current time, um, the, the democracies, are not themselves aligned on numerous concepts of 
even the simplest of regulations, if you look at the, the, the battle over the uh, Northern Ireland protocol and sending sausages across, across the seas, um, what, what, what is the evidence that, that democracy, democracies nowadays, even one so similar as the United States, England, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, are, are in fact sufficiently like-minded that they can reach consensus on things without allowing their nationalism senses to override the, the greater good. Okay, thank you, Richard. Before we go back to Frank Paul, is there anything you'd like to insert at this point for Frank's comment? Um, no, look, I mean, um, I'd rather give the time available to other people on the floor who okay, right. I'm sure would like to ask some questions. So even though I have lots of things to yes, right. chat further about, let's hear from other people. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Paul. So, so um, um, Frank, back to you, I think, just to, would you like to comment on Richard's yes. points? Yes. On this uh, point about uh, democracies are not aligned in many areas, um, I quite agree with that, and that is a concern. My message in the book is that they have to realize that while they have these differences, there's an overriding self-interest in overcoming these differences and getting their alliances back into order. It is not the kind of world we want where the EU wants to differentiate itself from the US just to flex its muscles. It should realize that it's thoroughly aligned with the US on the most important values. So that's, uh, that's the message there. Um, why did I say no to the EU? Well, I said no only in a comparative sense that um, it has this overriding political aim and therefore it goes beyond a mere consensus uh, between like-minded countries. So it's not a, um, it's not a model in, in that sense. Um, and the question of excluding the non-democratic countries, won't this make them turn away even more from international rulemaking? Yes, it may, but the values are too important. Um, and if it does, and if it, uh, um, if uh, uh, there is a cost to um, uh, standing by our values, I would say that that is a cost we have to face up to and that trying to uh, uh, ignore um, these other values um, in the past has been shown to be a huge mistake. All right. Um, Frank, I have one question here for you. Um, if international relations is guided are guided by simply political ideological differences where do how do you reconcile that or what's the relationship between that and interests <laughs> um well one would say that i i suppose the weasley answer is that actually it's in democratic countries' interest, own self-interest, to be firm on their own values. Right. Well, perhaps I can just be the uh, devil's advocate for a moment here, but um, you haven't mentioned interest. So, so is the argument that values automatically trump interest, no matter what those interests are or however important to the well-being of the people, values trump interests. Is that the conclusion? Um, I would say that you, you certainly have to filter your interests through a, a sieve of values, if you like, so that you might want to say we're going to do less trade or have less transactions, uh, we're going to cut our supply chains, um, around the uh, world for reasons of values, for example, s slave human rights being ignored in a state or something like that. So, so our so in interests might be uh, uh, made subordinate to uh, values. Yeah. So how far would you push that, if I may just again be the devil's advocate, our people are starving because we're standing on our values? Yes, I mean, you're... Uh, so, and you're saying in a way that, the, that let's say, the, um, uh, the Russia case is uh, relatively simple. We would say that if they're 
using slave labor or, um, or just uh, giving license to hackers, we would block them. Uh, that's a simple case. What do we do in Afghanistan where we don't like the uh, values of the uh, new regime, but people are starving, what do we do? Um, well, that's a tough one. And, um, and nobody has the answer to that, I don't think. Okay, well, uh, I don't have other questions listed, but I, I wonder whether, Paul, I might invite you back in at this, uh, at this juncture just to raise one or two maybe final issues. Just, uh, um, thank you, Dennis. I mean, just, I think the point that um, you made earlier and that Richard Clary echoed um, from a slightly different perspective uh, and I think you didn't regard it as your most important point, but maybe it is your most important point. Um, I think it was your first. I mean, and I think it is a fundamental, uh, uh, perhaps the fundamental dilemma, or at least the, one of the most fundamental issues, which is, you know, do you just close the tent doors, as it were, and say, right, you know, I mean, we're playing our game in here and your game out there is different. And I think the point you made about saying, well, actually there's really numerically quite a lot of states out there which aren't, certainly wouldn't be regarded as um, nice cozy democracies, but they're not uh, authoritarian either. And indeed, of course, within political science, there's a whole um, literature about a concept of competitive authoritarianism, where it's not pure authoritarianism, where there's still a democracy of kinds, but the game is tilted in favor of the status quo in various ways and all that kind of stuff. Um, like arguably in Hungary and Poland within Europe as examples, but they're not the only examples. Turkey would be another example, etc. cetera. Um, I think that when you start digging into those issues and, and in the difficulty, I think, of, well, the difficulty and danger of dividing the world into just, you know, the goodies and the baddies is actually, and that's not to say that there aren't some really appalling states and some really bad states, but on the one hand, whether the best strategy is just to say, we can't have any truck with you at all, um, or whether it is nonetheless in an imperfect and far from pristine manner to engage and try and get some modification, at least around the edges, whether that's better for the like-minded states still to be talking to the others, particularly the group, the third group that you identified, Dennis, which are the kind of non-aligned, um, I think is a, is, is a really major issue for discussion and deliberation. And I can see the arguments both ways. And of course, I guess if I was then arguing it from Frank's side, um, what, you know, and I think he probably does argue this in the book, um, uh, he can speak for himself, but it seems to me that the argument the other way would be, well, you can still have the like-minded states moving forward more cohesively by themselves on the basis that they have a commonality of interest which warrants that and which maximizes the possibility of action. And at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean closing the entire door of the tent, the stable or whatever to any discourse with either non-aligned states or even authoritarian states. And I think Frank should have the last word on that um, because if I was sitting in Frank's chair, that's, I guess, what I would say in response to, to Dennis's comment. Thanks, Paul. If I can, just on that point of the range of alignments, I think the policy score, uh, which comes out of one of the institutions in the states. I think the policy score ranks along the 190 or so nations. Roughly 25% are clearly on the democratic end. Roughly 25% are clearly on the authoritarian end, and I'm using those terms loosely. They have a whole set of criteria. Uh, 
the other hundred nations are roughly in, in the middle somewhere. Anyhow, Frank, you have the last word. Thank you. Well, the model very much is one which starts with a group of like-minded, but with the aim that they will bring other countries in. And that's why I cited the uh, example of the minimum corporation tax, which starts within the group of like-minded with OECDs endorsed by G7, then gets a much wider endorsement of G20, and then gets uh, almost uh, full international recognition. That is the model that brings in all your intermediate countries. The distinction between the democratic and authoritarian, a bit like uh, roles as well-ordered versus outlaw states is picking up the extremes at each end in order to make clear what the argument is. Okay, Frank, any other comment before we draw to a close? You have, you have no, I think uh, they're very helpful comments, actually, very thought-provoking. I'll have to go and take them away and um, think about them. And um, uh, I think Paul is right. I'm um, I'm going from a big picture comedy of what uh, yeah, yeah. trying to avoid conflict, recognizing uh, normative differences in the world, uh, going down to a narrower concept in order to address this bigger picture. Good. Well, Frank, we look forward to volume two, comedy volume <laughs> two, perhaps. Um, now, so, all right, I just, I think we probably should, um, we should stop there, although I've just noticed some further questions have come up, but I, I think probably we should, we should call it a, a stop there. So I'd like to thank you particularly, Frank, for taking part for, uh, well, for writing the book in the first place, that's no small achievement, and then for being willing to put yourself before the crowd here today. Paul, I'd like to thank you also very much for your most helpful comments. Uh, if Richard Kaplan is listening somewhere, Richard, we really are sorry you couldn't join us. We've been deprived of your wisdom, maybe on another occasion. 